Counting to God, Part 3. We've been looking at the book, uh, Counting to God, A Personal Journey Through Science to Belief, uh, by Douglas L., uh, written in 2014, um, and available online for free at Counting to God book um, at attitudemedia.com. And uh, that's the cover that he has. You'll notice the background of the slide has been taken from it. Um, we'll start with part one, setting the stage. Uh, we are in chapter five, which we covered yesterday, but there is a, an important note, at least I think it's important, that we did not touch on last time. And I think it's uh, interesting. Um, it's under the section the bias against design. And uh, um, in the middle of the paragraph, he says, I met one of the victims years ago and offered legal help to fight his mistreatment by the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the story will recognize that as Richard Sternberg. Um, and there's a note behind that, which is about three or four paragraphs long, which is worth looking at. Richard Sternberg has two PhDs, one in molecular biology and one in theoretical biology. He was a well-respected researcher for the Smithsonian Institution and the editor of a technical journal called The Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington. He is fair, open-minded, and an accepted scientist with more than 30 peer-reviewed articles in scientific books and publications. He also struck me as one of the nicest, kindest persons you are likely to meet. Richard Sternberg allowed his journal to publish a scientific article that noted evidence of design in the history of life. He didn't co-author the article. He simply allowed it to be included in the journal after it had been peer-reviewed by three other scientists, as well as himself. The article was by biologist Stephen Meyer and about the sudden appearance of numerous complex forms of life in the so-called Cambrian explosion of around 540 million years ago. We'll come back to this in chapter 12. Meyer's article concludes in part that analysis, quote, suggests purpose, purposive or intelligent design is a causally adequate and perhaps the most causal, causally adequate explanation for the origin of complex specified information required to build the Cambrian animals and the novel forms they represent. All Sternberg did was publish this article in his technical journal after it had been peer reviewed. That simple act provoked a firestorm of indignation, retaliation, and discrimination. He was demoted, given a hostile supervisor, forced to move offices twice, and ultimately to use a shared workspace, and his research privileges were limited, which is career death to a research scientist. Enormous pressure was placed on him to resign in disgrace. An investigation by congressional staff quote, uncovered compelling evidence that Dr. Sternberg's civil and constitutional rights were violated by Smithsonian officials, end quote. The staff report concluded that, quote, the failure of the Smithsonian officials to take any actions against such discrimination raises serious questions about the Smithsonian's willingness to protect the free speech and civil rights of scientists who may hold dissenting views on so topics such as biological evolution, end quote. All of this struck me as terribly wrong. Remember, Douglas Hill is a lawyer. Why should Richard Sternberg not be allowed to the freedom to edit his journal and publish articles in his journal as he saw fit? Why should he be attacked by Smithsonian in officials and special interest groups merely for allowing a discussion on the existence of design? I invited him to lunch and was amazed at what a genuinely nice guy he was, and it all struck me as very sad. I was troubled that he seemed all alone with no defender. I offered my legal services to represent him against the Smithsonian to preserve his job and his reputation. Richard ultimately decided it was not worth the fight, which was probably the right choice, and he moved on. And it's kind of interesting um, 
they took somebody who would be willing to listen to intelligent design and turned him into an intelligent design ag advocate by their actions. And remember, it wasn't just that they wanted his job and him. It was also that they got the paper retracted so that it doesn't count anymore, which is what they really wanted. They don't, it's not so much Sternberg, although Sternberg published it, and that was a bad thing to do. It was that it, was that it can't count as scientific because then you have to answer it, and they don't have an answer. But moving on to chapter six, which is our major topic for today, the great debate. What's new in the debate over the existence of God? And a quote from Bill Dembski, intelligent design will revolutionize science and our conception of the world. Well, only if science will allow it to, depending on how, what you call science. And that will be a really important question as we go through this. As I began my quest, I quickly realized I was following a well-worn path with an early choice to be made. I could walk the path with eyes of wonder and see evidence of design and purpose everywhere. Or I could walk the path and see the same beauty but no sense of purpose. We each choose our own way to view the world, our own paradigm of existence. What surprised me was not this fundamental choice but the animosity between those who view the world in different ways. In 2005, my path led me back to Boston and I was not prepared for the intensity of the emotions I encountered. Mm. I'm not reading the whole book, but this chapter will read most of it. Um, on November 2, 2005, I went to Boston to hear a debate on intelligent design. To me, intelligent design is simply the observation that design is a better explanation for the origin of life and the complexity of living systems than natural selection and neo-Darwinian theory. Now stop right there. Intelligent design, as we'll discuss, is more than that. Um, but we'll move on. Uh, according to Bill Dembski, one of, the debates, uh, one of the debaters that night simply put, intelligent design is the science that studies signs of intelligence. Intelligent design is based on the latest scientific information about how life really works, including the complexity within each cell in our bodies. Intelligent design uses probability theory and advanced mathematics regarding the complexity of information to conclude it is unlikely, very, very unlikely, that many of the amazing systems found in all life rose solely by natural selection. Chapters 9, 10, and 11 explore these concepts. We'll get to them later. Intelligent design has been viciously attacked by the popular press and the natural, National Science Foundation, who claim it is not science. But the real issue is not whether intelligent design meets some contrived definition of science. Note the quotes. And here you can see the division between science and what he considers real science and what I would agree with. Intelligent design passes Richard Feynman's test of what is science. It is consistent with observation and experiment. The real issue is whether there is evidence of design in biological systems, accident or design. That is the question. Well, it's a slightly broader question. We'll come to that. This bias against intelligent design was obvious that night. The debate was not about whether intelligent design is or could be a valid observation. The debate was limited to whether a public high school may even tell its students that the concept of intelligent design exists. The title of the debate was simply, Should Public Schools Teach Intelligent Design Along with Evolution? Can students be told that hundreds of scientists disagree with neo-Darwinian theory. Even this limited issue was, and is still is, controversial. In the weeks prior to the debate, many of the most uh, widely circulated newspapers and periodicals in the United States, including the New York Times and the Washington Post, denounced intelligent design. The suggestion that there is a philosophical choice to be made was angrily mocked. That's interesting way of phrasing it, angrily mocked. It suggests not just something that's stupid, it's something that is wicked as well, right? 
angrily mocked. The New Yorker magazine proclaimed, intelligent design is not science. Now, the New Yorker is one of my favorite magazines with, with often terrific writing and delightful cartoons, but it was sadly wrong. The American Heritage Dictionary defines science as the observation, identification, description, experimental investigation, and theoretical explanation of natural phenomena. Intelligent design is based on experimentation and on the observation and theoretical explanation of natural phenomena. Regardless of what the media or even the courts say, intelligent design is science. Intelligent design is not scientism. It is not consistent with a belief system that the natural world can by itself explain everything about the natural world, including how the natural world came to exist. Intelligent design is not consistent with the views of the mainstream scientific community and our popular media who ask us to believe only in, quote, science, end quote. Again, notice the differentiation between science and science with quotes in it, as if it were a religion, which arguably it is. All of our scientific progress, every discovery, every invention, every theory has come from observation, experiment, and reasoning. Observation, experiment, and reasoning are science. Science is not the National Science Foundation, although quote, science, end quote, is very closely aligned. And it is not all the institutions of higher learning. Science simply asks whether your theory is consistent with observation and experiment. Intelligent design passes that test. As I waited for the debate to begin, I thought of how the debate that night was part of an ancient and fundamental conflict, part of the real great debate. Is what we see and sense all there is, or is there a greater reality, a greater truth, a greater purpose? I'm sorry. The real great debate over this great question and ultimate truth has raged for thousands of years. The battle is fought on many levels, its major conflicts span generations, and its skirmishes define our times. Today, the forces fighting the great debate are largely divided into two very different camps. One side believes it all just happened and there is no greater reality. To them, the natural world is all there is, and there cannot be any greater reality. This is scientism. Persons who believe in scientism explain the amazing fine-tuning of the universe as simply our good fortune. They note that if it weren't just right, we wouldn't be here to observe it. Some argue that there must be an infinite number of universes with different physical laws and constants. We exist in a Goldilocks universe with everything just right because we could not exist in a different universe, they say. Uh, but he has difficulty with that and he refers you to chapter 9. As for the question of how life began and became so advanced, those who believe in scientism rally behind the image and theories of Charles Darwin. Life began, they sometimes claim, simply because conditions on Earth billions of years ago were favorable. Again, he takes issue with that in chapter 10. Life became so advanced, they argue with great fervor, by the inexorable process of natural selection. The fundamental tenet of their theory of evolution, which is also often called neo-Darwinism, or neo-Darwinian neo theory, is that all of the species that have ever existed and all of the special abilities and adaptations of those species arose solely because of accidental mutations and natural selection. The scientism side totally rejects, sometimes with gentle rebuke and sometimes with mocking derision, any suggestion that a greater being or greater reality is necessary to explain our universe or anything in it. As atheist Richard Dawkins put it, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Of course, the battle lines can be confusing. One can believe in neo-Darwinian theory and still believe in God. But neo-Darwinism is the main weapon that atheist scientism, naturalism forces used to counter our instinctive awe over the design of living creatures. On the other side of the great debate is the loose coalition I call belief. They believe in something greater. Some call it God. Some do not believe in a God, at least not the God of any traditional religion but they have a general sense of spirituality and believe in some type of greater reality. On the belief side, there is room for wonder. 
For the last 150 years or so since Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species was published in 1859, the belief side has been losing the great debate in the eyes of many Western institutions and intellectuals. In recent decades, what was a retreat has turned into a rout, at least according to our mass media. Attendance at religious services is no longer expected or commonplace among persons with a college degree. In some circles, it is unusual. Other than at a few religious institutions, it is generally impossible for a person who publicly challenges Darwin's theories to become a tenured professor. The popular press, whom you might uh, hope if they truly understood the subject would embrace freedom of choice and wonder, has instead viciously mocked proponents of design in the universe. A federal court actually ruled in Kitzmiller versus Dover Area School District in 2005 that it violates the con Constitution of the United States when a local school board informs high school students that intelligent design is an alternative to Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. The judge in the case actually ruled at the request of the American Civil Liberties Union, which somehow totally missed the point in this case that liberty includes the right to hold a dissenting view. As a lawyer, I find it embarrassing that the First Amendment to the Constitution designed to promote freedom of religion has been twisted to ban the teaching of legitimate science simply because it points to the existence of God. In effect, the case adopts scientism as the preferred and protected religion of the United States. It is a compound fracture of the legal system. Interesting turn of phrase. Another illustration of the stranglehold of the neo-Darwinian paradigm, at least with cultural elites. It's bad in the United States, but it's worse in the United Kingdom, where a new law mandates the teaching of Darwinian evolution as a, quote, comprehensive and coherent scientific theory. Never mind whether it really isn't. To me, that's sad and twisted. Politicians pass a law that purports to tell us what scientific theory we should believe in to explain the wonder of life. Kind of reminds me of the Indiana, um, I believe it's the House of Representatives, it's either that or the Senate, who passed a law that the, the official value of pi is three. Makes it simple that way. As if legislators had any uh, authority when it comes to, to uh, math. To the popular press in leading in universities, the great debate is over. Scientism has vanquished belief. Anyone or any group who dares suggest otherwise is branded as a heretic and is isolated and condemned. The popular paradigm cannot be questioned. Scientism is on the rise as we turn away from the wonders of existence. A few centuries ago, we farmed and hunted face to face with wonder. We have obscured the heavens with light pollution. We do not realize what we have lost. Although if you're a physician, you, it isn't totally obscured because you still look at a marvelous organism. I once sailed all through a cloudless, moonless night in Canada from Nova Scotia to Prince Edward Island. The Milky Way split the heavens from horizon to horizon. I steered three stars to the left of the Milky Way. Just imagine this gorgeous view. Powerful institutions, most colleges and universities, newspapers, magazines, and television and movie producers want you to believe that our universe is meaningless and pain pointless. A grand system where everything somehow arose by accident and with no purpose or design, but somehow miraculously gives the appearance of design. Their stature is enhanced by this empty yet popular paradigm. To these powerful institutions, there is no greater reality. Religion is generally tolerated, but only in the sense that people should be free to do whatever makes them feel good, and only if there is no pretension that religion or a greater reality have any role in explaining the creation of the universe, life, or human beings. Yet the great debate is far from over. The battle has entered a new and exciting phase. A counterattack has been launched, a counterattack aimed directly at the foundation of the scientism fortress. This counterattack is based solely on scientific facts and advanced logic. It does not look to the Bible, the Quran, 
or any other religious or historical source for justification. Yet it profoundly supports the concept of belief. By using only science, observation, experimentation, and logic, the counterattack exposes scientism for what it is, a system of belief. Not backed up by facts, by the way. A powerful weapon in the counterattack is the concept of intelligent design. It is so powerful that believers in scientism continually attempt to misstate it or ignore it. And that's also true. Intelligent design studies biological systems for signs of intelligence. It does this largely by... Now, again, this is a, a descriptive statement. We'll come back to it, but uh, it's not the whole story. And it's important that it's not the whole story. It does this largely by measuring the probability that biological systems could ever have been formed by accident. When the probability gets very low, intelligent design scientists conclude that the system was designed. Intelligent design stops there. It says nothing about who the designer was or what the designer's motives were. Those great questions are beyond science. Intelligent design claims if there are, natu pardon me, there are natural systems that cannot be adequately explained in terms of undirected natural forces and that any, in any other circumstances we would attribute to intelligence. But there are people who are not going there. Intelligent design has been viciously attacked, not so much for its claim that design can be detected, and not so much for the mathematical methods it uses, but because it trumps the belief system of those who consider themselves to be our ruling intellectual elite. It trumps scientism. Intelligent design is widely misrepresentative. misrepresented. Let's uh, look at how it works. The claim that design can be detective is intuitively obvious and used in other areas. Search for uh, extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial intelligence. SETI scientists have been attempting unsuccessfully for decades to detect design or intelligence in signals coming from outer space. Intelligent design suggests they're looking in the wrong direction and the evidence of design is within life. Or maybe both places can be looked for. SETI runs signals from outer space through computers programmed to recognize patterns. In the movie Contact, scientists conclude a signal was created by intelligent beings when it identifies in order, through beats and pauses, the prime numbers from 2 to 101. This type of pattern has what intelligent design scientists call specified complexity. It is the signature of intelligence. For specified complexity, you need three things. We're going to come back in just a minute to the note C on specified complexity. One, a recognizable pattern or specified event. In contact, this is the sequence of prime numbers. Two, the pattern must be complex in the sense it is extremely unlikely to have arisen by chance. And three, there must be no known natural cause. That is, other than intelligent causes, if you consider intelligent causes natural. Specified complexity, this is note C, has its roots in mainstream science, not in intelligent design. This is important. Intelligent design is simply borrowing it from mainline science. It was first proposed by noted origin of life researcher Leslie Orgel. In 1973, Orgel stated, living organisms are distinguished by their specified complexity. Crystals are usually taken as a prototype of simple, well-specified structures because they consist of a very large number of identical molecules packed together in a uniform way. Lumps of granite or random mixtures of polymers are examples of structures which are complex but not specified. The crystals fail to qualify as living because they lack complexity. The mixtures of polymers fail to qualify because they lack specificity. And that's uh, actually a quote from Leslie Orgel. If a pattern or event satisfies these three conditions, we can reasonably assume we have detected evidence of intelligence, just as in the movie Contact. We could be wrong. Theoretically, we might someday discover a natural reason why certain stars give out radio signals that, through beats and pauses, identify and order the prime numbers from 2 to 101. But there is no reason at this time to think that 
that will ever happen. So should SETI scientists ever detect such a sequence of primes, they would conclude it was generated by intelligence. And I think they would be right. Archaeology and forensics also use our ability to de detect specified complexity. It is intuitively obvious. A famous example is finding a watch on the side of the road. Would you think the watch was created by random processes or by an intelligent being? Or imagine hiking through a remote wilderness and finding a clearing with your name perfectly spelled out in large rocks. You would know someone had done it because it is, one, a recognizable pattern, two, impossibly light, unlikely to have happened by chance, and three, not a result of any known natu uh, natural cause. I'll diverge slightly here for a minute to note that when people argue against Paley's watch, um, they never argue that Paley was wrong. That no, watches just happen along the side of the road. They just say, but living organisms can reproduce and they can have um, mutations and the natural selection preserves the favorable mutations and so you don't need a creator for a living organism, even though you do for a watch. The point here is that nobody really disputes the question that intelligent design can be detected. The argument that is put forward is one that says that life doesn't qualify because there's a natural cause. Impossibly unlikely events happen all the time. To detect intelligence, you need a recognizable pattern. Intelligent design scientists like Bill Dembski have given this subject a lot of thought and have made it precise. Here's an example of, from Dem Dembski's book, The Design Revolution, that I find helpful. I should have italicized that and a few other things that got de-italicized in transferring and I missed italicizing them. Supposing you a flip a coin 1,000 times, whatever sequence of heads and tails you get, that is an amazingly unlikely pattern. And if you did it twice in a row, you would feel weird. Okay, now supposing someone else flips a coin 1,000 times, but he gets all heads. You'd think, you know, it was rigged. Sure, the odds of him getting 1,000 heads in a row are the same. 1 and 2 to the 1,000th, as of you getting whatever sequence you flipped. But he got a recognizable pattern. So how unlikely does a pattern have to be to detect intelligence? By the way, we're going to come back to this. Uh, does getting 1,000 heads in a row qualify? Here's where number sharpens the concept of intelligent design. You might think that even though it's not likely to happen to you or to any of your friends, if everyone on Earth st stood around flipping coins, it would likely happen soon. You'd be wrong. Dembski suggests a lower bound, a universal probability limit of 1 in 10 to the 150th. He gets that by taking the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in the visible universe. That's about 10 to the 80. Multiplying by the number of seconds since crea the creation of the universe, about 4 times 10 to the 17, multiplying by 10 to the 43rd units of Planck time in each second. A unit of Planck time, 10 to the minus 43 seconds, is theoretically the smallest time measurement that will ever be possible. Uh, for what it's worth, it's the amount of time it will take for a, a photon to pass through a hydrogen nucleus. When you multiply those numbers together, you will get about 10 to the 140th, which Dembski rounds up by more than 1 billion, 10 to the 9th, um, to conclude that in the entire history of the universe, there are far, far less than 10 to the 150th opportunities for any possible event. By the way, if you want some other numbers, 10 to the 40th is the number of organisms that have ever existed on Earth. So 10 to the 150th is way, way higher than that. Below 10, 1 in 10 to the 150, you've used up the, what he calls, probabilistic resources of the universe. 
In other words, if every proton, neutron, and electron was able to perform an event, such as flipping a coin 1,000 times, every 10 to the minus 43rd seconds, so remember this is ridiculous, since the beginning of the universe, the odds are less than one in a billion that an event with a probability of one, ten, one to 10 to the 150 will ever occur by chance. And we know that most of those things are not flipping coins. Intelligent design claims that if an event with a probability lower than one in 10 to the 150 occurs, and it has a specified pattern, whether in the series of coin tosses or in the usefulness of a particular arrangement of atoms. And if there is no known natural cause, then that event has specified complexity and is a signature of intelligence. Getting a thousand heads in a row has a probability of one in two to the 1,000th, or about one in 10 to the 301, far below Dembski's universal probability limit of one in 10 to the 150. So if someone flips a coin and gets a thousand heads in a row, you can conclude it was rigged. Matter of fact, if you had 500 heads in a row, you can conclude it was rigged. Intelligent design uses numbers, number in this way, to challenge the belief system of scientism. In later chapters, we will look at biological structures where the odds of formation by chance are far less than Dembski's universal probability limit. Some feel Dembski's universal probability limit is too low. Well, for practical purposes, it is. Some would suggest that below 1 in 10 to the 50th, specified events never happen. But I think Dembski is wise to be conservative and propose this much lower limit. If we want to claim something is unlikely to ever occur by chance in the history of the universe, we need to consider the probabilis probabilistic resources of the entire universe. Probability and religion. Probability arguments may seem a long way from religion and from the great debate over the existence of God. To me, they are compelling. Here's a true story of a low probability event. The year is 701 BC. At this moment in history, the Jewish nation is about to be annihilated. The Jewish king Hezekiah is trapped in Jerusalem, quote, like a bird in a cage, according to Sennacherib. His city is surrounded by the Assyrian army. It isn't a fair fight. The Assyrian army is unbeatable. On this military campaign alone, they have captured 23 walled cities. Jerusalem is next. The empires of Egypt and Assyria are at war. Jerusalem is located between the two empires in a dangerous position and vulnerable to the armies of both. King Hezekiah has sided with the Egyptians in this struggle, and in 701 BC, that appears to be a huge mistake. Twenty years earlier, another Assyrian army came within miles of Jerusalem. They laid siege to the city of Samaria. If you've never heard of Samaria, it may be because the Assyrians wiped it off the map. Samaria was much larger than Jerusalem and only about 35 miles away. Samaria was the capital of the northern tribes of the Jewish state. It held out against the Assyrian siege for almost three years. During the prior Assyrian invasion, King Hezekiah paid a large tribute and the Assyrians spared Jerusalem. But in 701 BCE, they are back and they want the city. The Bible records the taunt of the Assyrian general. On what are you basing your confidence that you remain in Jerusalem under siege? Do you not know what I and my predecessors have done to all the peoples of the other lands? Were the gods of those nations ever able to deliver their, hand, their land from my hand? Who of all the gods of these nations that my predecessors destroyed has been able to save his people from me? With the implied threat, yours won't either. Then something happened. Some think it was plague. Centuries later, Roman historian Herodotus wrote that the Assyrian army was overrun with rodents. The Bible says God sent an angel who killed the Assyrian army. A more recent theory is a nearby Egyptian army rescued Jerusalem, although that possibility is not supported by the meager historical record. All we know for sure is that the siege was lifted and the Jewish state, state survived. Now, suppose Herodotus got it right and plague struck the Assyrian army. 
That would still be an amazingly fortuitous event. It would also be an unusual medical event in that you want these soldiers to go to bed feeling okay, apparently, and then die in the, by morning. And it's really kind of hard to see how that would work. But in any case, it would still be an amazingly fortuitous event. Could it have been the hand of God? Perhaps. Does this amazing event which changed the history of the world prove there is a God? Of course not. As a matter of logic, it does not prove that God exists. It could have happened by chance. But how fortuitous that plague should break out at that critical moment in history. As a matter of logic, no event or fact can prove the existence of God as long as there is any other possible explanation. Similarly, no event or fact can prove that God does not exist. But this story of the Assyrian siege of Jerusalem leads to interesting questions. What if it could be proven that our universe is fine-tuned for life? What if it could be proven almost to a mathematical certainty that even the simplest form of life could not have arisen by chance? What would the odds have to be for you to believe in God? And it's a really important question. The next chapters describe new and amazing scientific evidence of wonder, what I call the science of belief. From cosmology to DNA to quantum physics, it's all there. Let's begin with a great question. Why does anything exist? And uh, that ends chapter six. My take on it, I like Ill's way of arguing. I only find two flaws in his argument. They're minor ones in my opinion. The first would be his example of 1,000 heads. That could not reasonably be chance, but it could be law. For example, the pennies have heads on both sides. A better example, at least in my opinion, can be found at uh, YouTube or um, in a post that I did on Common Descent. And some of you may remember this, uh, where you have three different sets of coins, at least one of which was done by throwing out 10, 20 coins in a row, lining them up, and then marking which ones were heads and tails, which is basically throw, uh, flipping coins. Um, one of them turns out to be what we call a pseudo-random number. And for those of you who can't recognize it there, it's the number pi in digital form, uh, pardon me, in, yeah, in binary form. And the third one, well, it doesn't take too much intelligence to figure out that was designed. And the point of that is not just that the third one is designed, but the third one is designed in anybody who knows English at all can recognize it. I'm pretty sure anybody who knows Spanish can recognize it, uh, even if they can't read it. And I'm I'm betting that anybody who learned Korean or Chinese, I, I think even illiterate people could figure out that, that number three is designed. Whether they can figure out what it, what it means is a different question. But, but that it was designed, I think, is clear. And that's because you can't account for that by chance, and you also can't account for that by law. Unless the law is very complex law that has to do with intelligence and English and so forth. The second very minor point has to do with his description of intelligent design. Um, and uh, there's a couple of other passages that, that say kind of the same thing. Intelligent design studies biological systems for signs of intelligence. It does this largely by measuring the probability that biological systems could ever have been formed by accident when the probability is very low. Intelligent design scientists conclude that the system was designed. It doesn't have to study biological systems. That sounds almost like a definition. And earlier, it's kind of used that way. But as he notes in his book, intelligent design also, and for some people preferentially, may look at the universe itself or the fitness of, for life of planet Earth, 
or the hard problem of consciousness, or as he will get through pretty soon, the question of how quantum mechanics works. And those also are intelligent design arguments. Uh, he is correct that ID most commonly challenges the origin of life and or evolutionary theory. But Guillermo Gonzalez lost his job over the privileged planet hypothesis, which has nothing to do with evolution, but everything to do with challenging the idea that the universe can run all by itself and has been doing that forever. When you start saying this planet was designed for life, them's fighting words. Again, note that science, is, uh, as he points out, is carefully distinguished from the current scientific consensus, which he puts in quote as science. Now, you can define science either way. But once you define it in one way, you need to use it consistently in that way and not use it for the other one. Because the debate is precisely over whether those two definitions of science are congruent. And he maintains, and I maintain, that they're not. Also, note how the dominant part of the intellectual elites of Europe and North America are using their view of science to force an atheist-friendly agenda on the culture. I am fully in agreement with the thrust of El's book here and most other places, which is one of the reasons why it's shown, and I can easily see why some of my creationist colleagues are impressed with the book. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. We seem to be convinced. <laughs> well, that's good. Go ahead. Well, it seems to me the, the, the key issue here is one which is usually ignored, and that is the definition of science. Uh, public isn't aware that there are different definitions of science. And uh, this makes them unaware of the restrictions that science has placed on itself. I'm putting science in quotes here. Uh, and so, um, to me, one of the very important things is, of course, what this chapter addresses, and that is, what do you mean by science? Uh, if science is going to restrict itself to facts, then, of course, it, it becomes a very boring and dull observation. No theory, theorizing is possible. Well, uh, and, it, and it's not true to uh, its heritage either. I mean, no. uh, to say that Newton mm. and Einstein were not part of science makes no sense. Uh, but as soon as you open that door, be it the multiverse door or the evolution door, uh, your science should allow for ideas that you cannot directly observe, but that you assume are, are plausible. And once you open that door, you can't say, well, we'll open this door, but you can't open the God door. That mm -hmm. one you've got to leave out. Yeah. And uh, the, the claim that's being made, of course, is that you don't really need the God door. This is this is uh, a simplistic comment. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you know this? If you make that claim, you're claiming that you understand everything and that you can draw proper conclusions, and that certain possibilities are not allowable. Uh, again, it's coming back to the same thing that uh, science has restricted its outlook. In the last century and a half, it's restricted its outlook, and 
it no longer qualifies as a method for arriving at truth. It has lost its credentials in certain areas, especially in cosmology or uh, ideas of origin and so on. Science can still, you know, uh, detect a lot, do a lot of good biochemistry and mm -hmm. uh, geology and so on, uh, whatever you want. It's fine. You don't have to invoke God mm -hmm. for a lot of things, but for certain things, uh, when you won't allow a certain ID, uh, this is restrictive and is not a search for truth. Kind of reminds you a little bit of the uh, of the drunk who uh, yeah. lost his cars, uh, lost his car keys down the street, and is looking <clears> for them <throat> under the lamppost because the light is better there. <laughs> yes, well. <laughs> Uh, and science, to, to, let's recognize that science does provide, in its experimental realm, uh, rather convincing arguments. But that experimental realm is very limited in terms of all the reality. But it tries to at least science in quotes, as uh, Doug would use the, the word, uh, tries to claim authority in the areas that it is not qualified to because it is so successful in the experimental area. Uh, you can't blame, to a certain extent, uh, I mean, it's hard to argue with success. Yeah. But it is uh, very restrictive to say, well, just because I'm successful here in this area, I'm an authority on everything else. You know, I was struck by the fact that uh, uh, when I made my presentation to the other class, um, that one of the uh, respondents said the problem is that we're de dealing with two different kinds of uh, definitions of science. And he seemed to prefer the one that excluded God to the one that, uh, mm -hmm. that simply takes ev all the facts and does the best it can with, uh, with the information it has. I found that fascinating. Um, I don't see why anybody would want that definition as the preferred one. It seems to me like uh, observation and, uh, and experimentation and reasoning from those should be kind of the basic definition of science and there should be no restrictions other than uh, we have more experience here, and therefore you might look here first, but certainly not to the exclusion of the other. But this is such an inconsistent position. Uh, we can speculate about all kinds of things except God. Um, be it uh, multiverses, be it uh, life arose here by some aliens, uh, leaving their picnic lunch garbage on the earth, and that's the way life started there. That's in well, the that's a better a better argument than 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 the one that came up spontaneously. Yes, well, it's, it, at least it acknowledges <laughs> that uh, it couldn't arise by itself here. That's right. Which uh, so it, it's uh, but uh, the public is not aware of this. It is very much aware of the success of science. Well, I think that's a deliberate strategy of some of these people. Uh, the, and, and this is what intelligent design does. It points out that there are problems with their theory. And that's why it's so viciously attacked. Is because <coughs> there are certain truths you must not say. because you will lead the unwary astray. 
believe. Yeah, one worry being anybody <coughs> who isn't convinced that science has all the answers to begin with and that science excludes God by definition. Which labels the man's search for truth as sociology. Yeah. I, I'm going to say something. You know, I pointed out that one change uh, that I would do, I would, uh, that intelligent design is a little more inclusive than the origin of life. And the reason I say <coughs> that is because um, uh, Francis Collins got viciously attacked on both sides by some people. Uh, one, for not agreeing that evolution doesn't have all the answers, uh, and for ruling the origin of life out of bounds, but he also got attacked on the other side for believing that cosmology gave us reason to believe in God. And, you know, while I disagree with him on the first part, I think we need to note the fundamental unity. Uh, Francis Collins is, in fact, an uh, ID proponent. He's just not ID on the origin of life or the, or the uh, origin of uh, the varieties of life we have. Um, and I think we need to understand those things. And the reason it's important is because, um, as you may know, there was a big flap from the atheist scientists when Francis Collins was going to be made head of the NIH. And he's certainly competent enough to do so, but he didn't belong to the religion. And, you know, it's just like no Catholics allowed. This one is no non-atheists allowed. Um, uh, we need to be careful about who we are shooting at. Wasn't he made director? Pardon me? Wasn't he made director? Wasn't he was eventually made director. It was, yes. of course, by Ronald Reagan, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, later, later than that. Who had a, or maybe it was, uh, I'd have, is, was it George Bush? I think it was. It was, more, it was more recent than Reagan. It was, it's, it was George Bush then. It was, who of course was a, um, you know, not a full believer in the, uh, the, the paradigm that the intellectual elite want to have there. I th you may be right. It was George Bush and not Ronald Reagan. Um, George Bush Jr., if I remember correctly, in that case. But, there, yeah, there was a big fight over it, and uh, he won anyway because he had support from the other side, which is good. But the, the point of it is uh, that intelligent design actually, when it comes right down to it, the real fight is the world must be made safe for atheism. And as long as you do that, you can do anything you want to. And you can believe in a God. It's okay, as long as your God doesn't do anything that would disagree with what atheists believe. You know, it's the same way as this history. If you, you can believe what you want to, was it an angel, was it uh, mice, was it uh, plague, um, was it an Egyptian army, well, anything but an angel because if it's an angel then that's God's direct intervention. But even if it's a plague, it's God's inter indirect intervention, you know? And that still makes him come. These people are no happier with the book of Esther than they are with the book of Exodus. And in Esther, nothing supernatural ever happens, right? But the plan is just too good. Uh, comment back there and then uh, Wesley. Francis Collins was nominated by Obama in 2009 
Really? According to Wikipedia. That's fascinating. Because you wouldn't think of Obama as being somebody who, is, who would support that. Uh, it's possible. That's interesting. Somehow I had connected him with uh, somebody a little more on the conservative side. <laughs> but I do know that there was a big fight over it. And that he got in because of support by other people who finally uh, said this is enough political correctness and uh, he's certainly done what he needed to. Thank you for that yeah. point. What I uh, am hoping to be able to say, it's not completely formulated in my mind yet, is based on a given that intelligent design is true in the sense that uh, a pattern suggests some kind of an intelligence. The thrust of what most of what we've been talking about is towards God being that intelligence. And uh, I'm going to, for the moment, pass on beyond that since I believe that is a given. And suggests that intellig the thrust of the question of intelligent design then is not merely whether God exists, or an, but an intelligent exists, and that equally important to the consideration is that an intelligence named Satan exists. If God is proven by a pattern, certainly infinitely intricate pattern from biology to the molecular level to the cosmos, perhaps the fact that there is a pattern that contradicts his exist existence is an equal proof to something that people sometimes are even less likely, less willing to accept that there is such a thing as Satan. And that there is such a thing as the great controversy. I think that to the degree that intelligent design points towards God, it is remarkable. And certainly, perhaps even God intended. But that it also points to the rest of something called the intel uh, great controversy, I think is equally important and is certainly not likely to enter, in on to enter into the stage of debate that uh, we're now seeing exist, now exists in behalf of the existence of God. Perhaps, and that's too much to expect, but I think that uh, we as Adventists, certainly on my behalf anyway, I take quite a bit of comfort uh, towards the existence of the great controversy from intelligent design. The fact that the arguments that you have been reviewing against God, that these people who are so adamant against intelligent design are so intricate and so well woven must in itself prove an intelligence which well, can only come from an intelligence comparable to that of God himself, namely Satan. I couldn't agree with you more. I, 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 I'd be real careful about using prove in the in the, uh, in the mathematical sense, but certainly uh, make morally reasonable and uh, prove in the scientific sense in some ways, you know, to beyond a reasonable probability of being wrong, I think I would agree with you. Um, the actions of these people say that there's more at stake 
than simply a scientific disagreement, you know. Uh, some people like tea, and some people like coffee, and some people like neither, and some people like both, and so what? But, you know, you start suggesting that, uh, uh, that some people are resisting intelligent design for non-scientific reasons, them's fighting words. What's the fight about? Well, it's about the people don't like um, for whatever reason they don't like to be wrong about this particular issue. I think you're expanding on what I was trying to say and I appreciate your perfecting what I was trying to say. Thank you. Anyway, uh, I'm I'm very interested in this idea because um, I I worked with a, with a woman. Who, we were doing therapy with abused children who had suffered such severe trauma, and she was the most compassionate and passionate woman about her work. But it was very interesting. One time I said something about an evil. She could not accept the word evil because that. That implies something, and she she was very very mild about this whole thing. But evil to her was something. No, she said, I think this just happens to be the road that she had, and she took it, and and that's that's it. She was stuck with, but not evil. Mm -hmm. She had trouble with that concept, and I think that's again a denial of Satan because of the uh, the. When you begin to accept Satan, mm -hmm. then that brings God in. Well, you, the other thing is you accept um, you accept the reality of evil, and with a very small twist, suggest that you have some choice in the matter, and that means that mm -hmm. you have responsibility too, now, yes. and some responsibilities that you may not have even fulfilled. Mm -hmm. You might be some of those. Well, at least partly evil people. And that's not a happy thought at all. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as intelligent design, it actually argues that way. I mean, let's supposing that we find that some of the poisons that are in uh, rattlesnakes or cobras or whatever seem to be designed in order to mess up the uh, uh, physiologic systems of prey or predators. Now, if all you have to do is one or two amino acids, you, well, you know, it might happen by chance. But if you're starting to take a protein and kind of rework it from something that, that starts out with, uh, say, 150 amino acids and you have to do 100 of them to make this work, then it looks like you may be looking at a design system. And from the looks of it, a malevolently designed system. And uh, from a scientific perspective, I think we just have to say, okay, so that's the way it is. Then there's more than one designer. We don't know how it was designed. We don't know when it was designed. But either we have more than one designer or we have a designer who has good and bad impulses. Uh, I suspect that it's more likely to be more than one designer. But th if you think about it, intelligent design doesn't say optimal design. It, it can include either malevolent or incompetent design. Ford Pintos were still designed even if they had gas tanks that could blow up if you hit them from the rear. Um, and AK-47s and Tomahawk missiles are very definitely designed. People work a long time getting those things to do what they want to do. Uh, napalm throwers and the fuel that they're made in are explicitly designed with uh, parameters in view so that they can inflict 
severe and in, case, in the case of flamethrowers, horrific damage. That's design. And so if we find those kinds of things in, in organisms, well, there's more than one designer. Uh, you're pretty much forced to that. But then if you go with the, there, there is only one designer, uh, then you can hate that designer. Which is the that route, is true. The route that and it makes it nice. It, it, there is no God, and I hate him. <laughs> well, uh, this this uh, brings me back to a comment I've made previous weeks or months, and that is that once you open the door to a designer. Uh, this causes you to wonder, well, if God designed us, would he not communicate with us? Now, you could postulate a God who wouldn't, but it's more likely that he would. And then you look for what is the best communication I can think of from that a designer, uh, is it the Quran or is it the, the Vedas of Hindu or uh, the Bible and so on? And to me, the, the Bible makes the most sense because it is the closest to science because it has a cause and effect theme. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's rational. Yeah, yeah. And reality seems to be rational. And so I put that all together. That package makes more sense yeah. to me. I would even go further than that and say that it's very possible that uh, Confucius and the Tao were the remnants of a communication system that God did make originally, and that Zoroaster actually did get some revelations. Um, his followers may have confused some of that, but then again, the followers of Jesus have confused some of that too, so you can't be too hard on them. And that we may find out that God's been speaking in every time and every place. And we just don't always listen. So, uh, you know, I, I happen to think that the biblical revelation is the best we have. And I think that strongly enough to have learned to read uh, most of it in the original languages. I'm still working through the Old Testament. Hebrew is a little tougher for us. <laughs> It, it explains the origin. It explains the origin of evil very nicely in the yeah. context of, of the great controversy. Right. I think that the big issue is that accepting a creator God suddenly makes me responsible, mm -hmm. and that's scary. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Unless I go through the whole sequence and accept Jesus as my Savior, then it's not so scary. Yeah, yeah. And that's why it's called the good news. Um, but yeah, I think these I think these questions start people on a road that many of them are simply not willing to go down. And it's a lot easier to say, but it's not science and therefore it doesn't count. Uh, again, using a definition of science that excludes God, it's very convenient. I think Douglas L is protesting against this and I think he's right about that. One more comment. and. Thank you. Um, I thought his I, his um, 
perspective as a lawyer was very interesting when he brought up how they've appealed to civil law to suppress uh, some of the things that have been done just to uh, allow intelligent design and how uh, England has itself has also passed laws and, and I, uh, I think that we are in a very interesting time when the uh, bankruptcy of their arguments is now forcing them to appeal to civil law so it's like it's like a religion that needs the government to support it because it itself can, can no longer continue to, to get people to believe what they want them to believe. And so it seems like we are entering that phase. And, and without a governing body, you know, it's loosely held, like in National Academy of Sciences and others, it doesn't seem like they're going to ever able to rally what they need to counteract what eventually would be um, their undoing. And I think that's why so many of them are afraid when I listen to debates, because they can see that they don't have the ability to, to get the support they need, especially from atheists who traditionally aren't, I don't want to say are bad people, but they're not good people. And atheists have said that themselves. When they look at religion, the religious people are doing all, mostly the good works in the world. They're the ones who are doing all these things. So there's something there that they can't tap into. Dawkins is trying to get some sort of uh, uh, charity together where he goes and helps people and there's no mention of God. And I think there are other charities out there. But they're not that strong because the people that they appeal to are not that unified. So I, yeah. I see it as this is what I, I think when you look in prophecy, you look at Daniel chapter 11 when the king of the south, which is what some people think is a force of atheism, pushes at the king of the north, the king of the north being religion or Christendom, um, suddenly the king of the north wipes out the king of the south and there's no place for the king of the south being found anymore. So to me, I see it as encouraging as, as a fulfillment of, uh, of prophecy uh, at this time as we see the, the forces of atheism slowly being destroyed or being wiped out or being silenced. Um, I think science is the last vestige of that, of that system, that king of the south uh, on prophecy. Yeah. Well, I think that they feel the hollowness of their position. Uh, I, as has been pointed out, for science in general, it's not true with evolutionary biology. Evolutionary biology is like 75% pure, unadulterated atheist. Uh, and other people are lesser stripes, more or less. But uh, I think there's like about 3% that believe in in uh, the kind of God that you and I would uh, find, uh, you know, reasonably godlike. But uh, but for the rest of the the question was put: Do you believe in a God that answers prayer? And it's not just psychology. And that was put in specifically to avoid the people. With, but it's a good idea, and it makes you juiced and, you know, uh, psyched up, and, you, and and so it will influence you. So it's a good idea to pray, even though it really doesn't do anything to anybody else. And you know, um, they're not talking about that kind of God. They're talking about the God who actually, outside of you, answers your prayer. And 40% of scientists said yes, 45% said no, and 15% didn't know. Now think about it, what happens if that 40% grows to 50% and they realize that, that, that that's what is going on? All of a sudden, these people haven't got a prayer. They're going to be voted out by the majority. They are scared stiff that their position will no longer be the dominant one and that they can't support it without the cultural dominance. So, uh, you know, and, and they, they feel, you know, in a line to be martyred and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you read some of these people and you just, you get that feeling that they're, that they're not at all secure as to whether they've got science under their belt. And it, the, People are persecuted not just because they are against the mainstream. 
they're also persecuted because they are uh, against, uh, they're, they're perceived as a threat to the mainstream. You know, some guy is, you know, kind of mentally de deficient. Nobody persecutes him. You know, they may think they're kind of nutty, but if they're not, you know, actively injuring people and people just let him go, you know that guy, he doesn't have much brains on. But, but if somebody actually has a case, that's when the persecution starts. And it's really, in a way, it's a sign of weakness. It says you can't win the argument on its own merits. And I think we're getting close to that point where, where even having cultural dominance isn't going to be enough. And perhaps once that happens, they won't have cultural dominance. And when that happens, um, that whole way of looking at things suddenly collapses because it's got nothing to support it. And look what happened. Communism kept going and going and going and going and going. And then all of a sudden, somebody who'd lived all of his life under communism got to be the ruler of the Soviet Union. And he realized that you can't keep going this way by blaming everything on the Tsars. Well, we're, we don't have it perfect, but you know, at least we're better than them. He lived all of his life that way. And he said, this is no way to run a government. You need to be honest, you need to be open, and you need to restructure so that things make sense. And of course, Chernobyl pushed him further in that direction. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, once people realized that you weren't gonna get shot for crossing a border, Eight weeks later, the entire of Eastern Europe had folded. And two years later, the whole Soviet Union had folded. And China is not really communist in the traditional sense anymore. We have a few outliers right now, like North Korea. We don't even have Vietnam anymore. I mean, they've kind of, uh, they're officially communist, but, you know, not really not in the strictest sense. And I think we're seeing the same kind of thing happening with the intellectual elites of Europe and North America. I think there's going to be, it's going to keep going and going and going and then all of a sudden it's just going to collapse. It's sort of like a little baby who is losing blood and the blood pressure is maintained and the blood pressure is maintained and the pulse goes up and they breathe faster but the blood pressure keeps going and going and going and then all of a sudden, boom. Mm they go down. And we're just, we're, we're in that stage of this particular uh, phenomenon. That the compensatory mechanisms are ramping up more and more and more. But the compensatory mechanisms are telling you that underneath there's a huge disease. But we will see what happens. Anyway, come back next week and we'll get into why is there anything.